How do we come to believe that Jesus Christ is the second person of the Trinity or that he is the second God, that he was a begotten God or God the Word? How do we get to believe in such things? Well, in this video by Dr. William Lane Craig on the Trinity part, the deity of Christ, he kind of gives us a glimpse of how the Catholic Fathers came to believe such things. You see, he mentions that this was a common idea with all the, the Greek philosophers. And he mentions Philo of Alexandria, the one who I have been talking about for more than eight years now on YouTube, that he's responsible for giving us the Trinity Doctrine because he gave us more than the Logos teaching. But here, because uh, Dr. William Lane Crane, Craig is a Trinitarian and he sees nothing wrong with philosophy being mixed with the Gospel, which is a huge error, and that is the same error that is proclaimed by the Roman Catholic Church. But no, the Gospel is not philosophy, and the Apostle John was never a Greek philosopher. The teaching that John gives in, in John 1.1, 1, 1, which is known as a prologue, has nothing to do with the Greek philosophy and has everything to do with divine revelation. So let me, let me play a little bit of uh, Dr. William Lane Craig's teaching where he talks about the influence of Middle Platonism. And Logos, uh, excuse me, Philo was known as the second Plato. That's how strong he was. And you can find Philo mentioned in the writings of the anti nicene Fathers. So we know. And then, especially the writings of Eusebius, uh, who wrote Eusebius Ecclesiastical History, and who was responsible for the rough draft that was given at Nicaea that ultimately became the Nicene Creed. And Eusebius was a follower of Philo also, the same as all the Catholic Fathers, from Ignatius all the way to Athanasius you will find this link. So yes, it is Philo who influenced the Catholic Church into accepting the, the, the philosophy that the Logos, which is the mind of God, is the instrument of creation by which God creates the world. And they put it together with Christ as being the Father's agent of creation. Do want to affirm that Christ is the agent of creation. He is the, the Father's agent of creation. That's right. That, um, th and this is especially evident in this idea of the logos or the word. The, this is one of the most interesting examples of the influence of philosophy upon the New Testament. This idea of the logos or word of God as the agent of creation, the means or instrument by which God created the world, is not unique to John or to the New Testament. It characterizes um, a philosophical school called Middle Platonism, which developed during the centuries after Plato wrote. Middle Platonists believed that the Logos which is it's sort of the mind of God in a way, uh, is the instrument of creation by which God creates the world. And Jewish, uh, Hellenistic Jews, Greek-speaking um, Jews outside of Israel, like Philo of Alexandria, Egypt, talk a great deal about the, the Logos as God's agent of creation. Yeah, you read Philo, it's almost like reading the prologue of the Gospel of John. Um, so this is a, a very common idea in the ancient world, that the Logos is the means by which God creates the world. But in Judaism, for Philo as for others, there's a clear dividing line between God, who is alone uncreated, and the rest of reality which is created and dependent on him. And things like God's word and God's wisdom 
belong on God's side of the dividing line. These are personifications of attributes of God um, and belong on God's side of the dividing line between creator and creature. So, for example, some New Testament scholars have spoken of Christological monotheism. Um, Christ, the word of God, is divine. He's not a creature. He's not a product of any creative act of God. He is on God's side of the dividing line between God and creation. Um, so I think you're, you're quite right in saying that on the New Testament doctrine, we should think of the second person of the Trinity as the one through whom God creates the world.